Hi guys, today we want to talk about Defenders of the Faith by Judas Priest. Now, why would we want to do that? Because it is exactly 40 years since the release of this record here. Well, as KK said, this album is celebrating its 40th anniversary now, and this is the Judas Priest album that contains my favorite Judas Priest song ever. And you can guess what song that is. So I'm going to talk about this album, how it was received back then, what other people said about it, all the controversies, and also the influence it had on other genres. Plus, I will scatter in some facts that are little known throughout the video. Three things that one of them is a connection to Kiss, actually. Plus, I will tell you if I think this album is better than Screaming Conventions or if this is even the best Judas Priest album ever. So this album came out in 1984, in January 1984, and was a follow-up to Screaming Conventions, but it had been a very successful album for the band, so there was a lot of pressure on them. Uh, the, the cover of the, of the album is some sort of a medallion, I think it's called. It's a kind of tiger-like animal on you know, tank wheels or something with some guns, you know. Probably someone you wouldn't want to meet in a dark alley at night. It had 10 tracks, and I would say that the A side of the old kind of vinyl thing was amazing. That was uh, Free Will Burning, Jawbreaker, Rock Hard Ride 3, and then Ends on the Sentinel. For me, this is one of the strongest A sides of kind of metal history of any album. And in the band back then was KK Downing, uh, Glenn Tipton, Ian Pace on the bass, Rob Halford singing, and Dave Holland on the drums. During the recording process, there were some tensions between the band and this. Uh, as far as I know, it's the first album that Glenn and KK did not write together in the same room. They wrote their parts and their songs separately. But let's hear from KK. Where was this album actually recorded? Um, we recorded this, let me say, for the mainstay of it was uh, in Spain. And then we moved to Florida to do some more recording and mixing. Thank you for that, KK. So the songwriting on this album is KK Downing, it's Glenn Tipton, and it's Rob Halford, apart from one song called Some Hats Are Gonna Roll. That's uh, written by a guy called Bob Halligan Jr. And he actually also wrote two songs on Kiss Hot in the Shade. I don't know exactly which songs these are, but you can check them out. And he did uh, one or two songs on Halford's uh, solo album Resurrection as well. Now, how was this album received? Uh, the critics were kind of negative at that time. I mean, they were comparing it a lot to Screaming Conventions and they, they didn't really necessarily like that comparison. But I think over the years, people have started to appreciate this album a lot more than it had at the time it was published. But there was one group of people that was not very happy with this album because one of the songs, Eat Me Alive, well, this is number three on the Paris Music Resource Center's Filthy 15, a list of 15 songs that the organization found most objectionable. So, Tipper Gore, uh, Al Gore's wife, uh, she was the founder of that organization or co-founder of that organization, and she thought that this song was about some sort of a sexual act at gunpoint. I'm not even going to say what it was. Uh, and then Priest actually answered that by, on the next album, on Turbo, they put a song called Parental Guidance and uh, to kind of make fun of this. And I've seen some interviews where they, are, they were very, very surprised about this and of course denied the accusation. Now, and here comes the second interesting fact that you might not know. This is not the only song and the only time that Judas Priest got into trouble with a song because a song from this album, Some Heads Are Gonna Roll, was actually listed on a list of 168 songs uh, published by some organization in the US after 9-11 that should not be played on radio because of the nature of the lyrics or something like that. On that list were also songs like Shoot the Thrill by ACDC, even Imagine by John Lennon. So I don't know exactly what was wrong with those songs, but they were definitely not being played on the radio in the aftermath of 9-11. But the fans loved it, regardless of all the angry moms and all the organizations trying to cancel the music, they loved it, because this album has one of the, the most songs that have been played. Actually, of this album, all songs have been played live, but also most times of many of their albums. And on the charts, it did very well. In the UK, it did 19th place, and, and in the US, 18th place. And commercially, it sold platinum in the US. That's like a million records or something like that. So let me ask KK, though. What do you think about this album? This is probably one of my favorite albums. Uh, okay, KK might be slightly biased, but to follow up on this album, they went on a tour that went from the uh, end of January to August or something that year. So what influence did this album leave at the time? And uh, Tom Araya, Dave Mustaine and Lars Ulrich have all mentioned this album as a very influential album on their career, an album that they still like to this day. And if we take what Tom Araya said here on, on a, in a movie, I think, uh, 
He said, the Defenders of the Faith is a thrash metal masterpiece. It's one of the albums that help to shape the genre. The songs are fast, furious, and heavy as hell. It's an album that I will always cherish. And I think he is onto something, because when I started listening to this album again now, it is super fast. There is a lot of stuff that I can say, oh yeah, I can see where you know, Metallica got this, or where this guy's got that, or whatever. Now, is this album better than its, let's say, sister album, Screaming for Vengeance, or even their best album? Now, for me, this album, it kind of grew on me. I learned to appreciate it much, much later. I would always have picked British Steel because of Living After Midnight, Breaking the Law. These are songs that I kind of grew up on, and, and I love them very much, but I realized over the years that this album is much more evenly strong than I feel you know, like British Steel or even some other of their albums. And it has a super strong start. I mean, it has my favorite Judas Priest song ever, The Sentinel at the end of, of Side A on the old Reno. And that's kind of the song actually that turned me onto this album. And then I started to appreciate all the other stuff that is there. Now, the standout songs for me on this album are uh, The Sentinel, definitely, and Love Love Bites, not Love Bites, the Japanese band, but Love Bites. And uh, also, here comes the third little less known fact about this album. There is a song on it that I really like called Rock Hard Ride 3. And that song is kind of repurposed because that was recorded as a song called Fight For Your Life for Screaming For Vengeance in 1982, but never put out. They changed that song, they added an intro, they changed the chorus, and they changed the how the chorus ends. And it's actually an anthemic, sing-along, great stadium song. And I'm so happy they didn't put that song out in 1982 because that would never have, that would have fallen flat on its face. So comparing this to Screaming for Vengeance, I feel that this album has a little bit more of a polished sound uh, and the songs are a little bit more straightforward. There is less experimenting going on. This is kind of straightforward metal. And I feel that it's, but it's a gradual increase or gradual development from Screaming for Vengeance, definitely. And I feel that the sound is a bit more polished and more commercial, you can say. I mean, they're using synths on the Sentinel, and on some, some hats are going to roll as well, which then they would take, you know, to a completely different direction on, on Turbo. I feel on this album that this is somehow where they kind of mastered their craft. You know, the, I find the, you know, the sound quality and the, the, these things somehow, this is what Judas Priest is for me somehow. And I felt that Screaming for Vengeance were a little bit more raw, and the, whereas this was more sophisticated. But both are heavy albums, and I feel that uh, in some way, uh, Defenders of the Faith is a little bit faster somehow and more aggressive in that sense, but with a more polished sound somehow. So I would say this is my favorite Judas Priest album. And for me, the, the first eight songs out of 10 are actually really good. And actually the last two songs are kind of, I don't know what they are, but they are very short and they're very different somehow. And uh, so I'm curious to hear if you agree with this on what you think is the best Judas Priest album ever. I'm very much looking forward to see them. Uh, the album is coming in, a new album is coming in Mars this year, and I'm going to see them live later that month. So that's going to be really, really cool. And I'm, I'm make sure you subscribe because I'm going to do a, both an album view and a concert view on that. And then guys, check out my KK's Priest album review here and my 10 best albums of 2023 here. I'll see you in those videos.